Welcome to today's episode of Licentia Hub. As discussed on previous episodes, we saw medical nursing, surgical nursing, and others. Today's episode is basically going to be on general paper. Now, what does the NMC Licentia General Paper entail? It entails surgical nursing, medical nursing, obstetric nursing, pediatric nursing, public health nursing, psychiatric health nursing, and general knowledge. Today's episode on general paper is going to be focused on obstetrical nursing and pediatric nursing. We're going to discuss some various multiple choice questions on obstetrical nursing and pediatric nursing that might pop up in your final and testing exams, MCQs. That is what we are going to discuss for today. To begin with, the question on the screen that we the anterior and posterior fontanel are usually present at birth. The posterior fontanel closes by option A, six to eight weeks, B, two to four weeks, and C, four to six weeks. Answer this question very correctly. We need to borrow back our knowledge on obstetrical nursing, especially the fetal scar. You remember, the fetal skull is the largest and hardest part of the fetus at birth. On the fetal skull is where you can see some things that we call the fontanels. One may ask, what is a fontanel? A fontanel are membranous, non-ossified areas on the fetal skull, which are joined by sutures. Now, what then is a suture? In obstetrical nursing, we say sutures are just spaces in between bones on the fetal skull. That allows for overlapping during delivery. And that overlapping during delivery is what we term as molding. So it is important for us to have sutures which allows for what? Molding. Now, where two or more sutures meet on the fetal skull is what we call the fontanel. And as I said earlier on, said, they are non-ossified, meaning they are not hard. Ossification has to do with the disposition of calcium and mineral salts in a bone to make it hard. Therefore, when I say fontanels are not ossified, it means that they are not or, or there has not been calcium deposits inside, and so they are soft bony prominences on the fetal scalp. We have about six fontanels on the fetal scalp. We have the posterior fontanel, the anterior fontanel, the two sphenoidal fontanels and the two mastoid fontanels. By an obstetrical nursing, the most important to us is the posterior fontanel and the anterior fontanel. Now, the question is seeking our knowledge on when the posterior fontanel closes. When you take the posterior fontanel, by six weeks to three months, it should close. When you take the anterior fontanel, by one to three years, it should close. And so looking at the question, it's asking us the weeks that the posterior fontanel will close. Option A gives us 6 to 8, option B gives us 2 to 4, and option C gives us 4 to 6. Per my explanation, the appropriate answer should be from 6 to 8 weeks. And so the correct answer to this question is 6 to 8 weeks. One we also meet in his MCQs, since you are talking about fontanels, Let's elaborate more on this. The posterior fontanel can somewhat be described as a triangular shape in nature. And so when you see your MCQ, where they are asking that the type of fontanel that has a triangular shape, you should quickly know that that is a posterior fontanel. Whereas the anterior fontanel is described as a diamond ring shape. A diamond ring shape. Next question. It reads, Miss Gonu had delivered a preterm baby. The survival rate of a preterm infant is dependent on A. Maternal age, B. Gestational age, and C. Maternal nutrition. Before one can understand and answer this question carefully, one needs to know what we mean by preterm. A preterm baby is someone or a baby who has been delivered less than 37 weeks of gestation. So any baby giving birth to less than 37 weeks of gestation is described as a preterm baby. We have three basic types of preterm in obstetrical nursing. We have the extreme preterm, 
which means that they are less than 28 weeks of gestation. So a baby born less than 28 weeks of gestation is termed as an extreme preterm. We have the early preterm, which takes from 28 weeks to 32 weeks of gestation. Those are the early preterm babies. Then we have the late preterm or the moderate preterm, moderate or late preterm. And they are from 32 weeks to 37 weeks. So this is what a preterm baby means. Babies giving birth to less than 37 weeks of gestation. Now the question was asking us about the survival rate. Looking at option A, maternal age. Maternal age, yes, are mothers or who have advanced age of 35 years and above. These mothers have the risk of giving birth to preterm babies. And so maternal age is a risk factor for giving birth to a preterm baby. But the question didn't ask for risk factors. And so makes option A irrelevant to our answer. Option B, gestational age. Does gestational age play a role in survival rate of a preterm baby? Yes, of course. Gestational age is a distinctive factor that comes in play when you want to look at the survival rate of an infant. Option C talks about maternal nutrition. Does maternal nutrition play a role in preterm? Some way, somehow, maternal nutrition will more be attributed towards the, the mother's eating habit during pregnancy. If the mother doesn't take in good or balanced diet, that can lead to anemia. And so maternal nutrition is a risk factor that propels one to get an intrauterine death or fetal growth retardation. And so the survival rate does not also depend on maternal nutrition. And so our correct answer in this question will go for gestational age as what is dependent on the survival rate of a preterm baby. Next question. A 29-year-old para-2 had a vaginal delivery following a postpartum hemorrhage of 2.5 liters. She presents to you after eight months and complains that she has not resumed her menstruation and experiences easy fatigue. She is bottle feeding and states she was unable to breastfeed due to inadequate milk supply. Her home pregnancy test is negative, followed by a negative beta HCG level. Which of the following is the most likely reason for amenorrhea? A. Lactational amenorrhea. B. Sheehan's syndrome. And C. Pregnancy. Looking at this question, let us delve into the various options given. Option A is saying lactational amenorrhea. What then is lactational amenorrhea? Lactational amenorrhea is breastfeeding that temporarily stops pregnancy. Now lactation, during lactation, your body is making breast milk for you to breastfeed the baby. And so at that instance, the hormones that are noted for breastfeeding may temporarily stop menstrual cycle. Now, option B, the Sheehan syndrome. What is that syndrome? This is a syndrome that happens when you have an injury to the pituitary gland as a result of severe blood loss during pregnancy. This blood loss during pregnancy comes to injure the pituitary gland and can affect how one will have his or her menstruation in the nearby future. Option C, pregnancy has no direct link in what they are asking the question. And so going back to the question, the question attributed that there was a blood loss of 2.5 liters. And so looking at all the parameters defined in this question, that is Sheehan's syndrome. Because the blood loss has caused a significant injury to the pituitary gland. And you know very well that when the hypothalamus produces its hormones, which are the oxytocin and the antidiuretic hormone, it goes and stores it at the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And so it is left to the pituitary gland to release this oxytocin when needed. Likewise, the prolactin hormone noted for the production of breast milk is also at the anterior lobe. And so if there's an injury to the pituitary gland, you realize that it will affect lactation. Hence, our correct answer will be the Sheehan's syndrome in this question. Next question. It reads, in planning nutrition education for pregnant women at the antenatal clinic, 
the most important point the health worker should consider is the a economic status of the women b local eating habits and food available in the community and c social class of the people looking at this question they are seeking our knowledge when planning a nutritional need for a pregnant woman antenatally option a is talking about economic status of the woman is that relevant as of the planning stage we will find out later option b tends to look at the health worker exploring the local foods available in the community and what foods the community people eat now looking at the two parameters given you realize that in the planning phase it is very very relevant for the health worker to ascertain the local eating habits in the community and the food also available in the community so that he the health worker or she the health worker can help plan a nutritional diet for this pregnant woman and so that will be considered the most relevant when come when we are planning the nutritional care for this patient antenatally and hence justifies our option b as a correct answer thank you very much cherished viewers and listeners this comes to the end of today's episode of licentia hub i'll urge you all to continue to subscribe to the channel that is those who have not yet subscribed so that as and when we release a video you'll be notified in the notification box so that you don't miss any of our interesting videos that we upload thank you very much and see you on our next episode.